are, we are concluding. It's been a very a good series looking at the different churches. And, you know, it's been also a very challenging series. Um, we've, we are... We, are, we have been challenged in looking at the different areas in which these different churches have been rebuked by the Lord. And, and then you've seen churches, uh, only two of the seven that have been, uh, had no rebuke from the Lord. And so it's been, it's been kind of a, a roller coaster ride looking at how God has been interacting, how God interacted with these churches uh, uh, 40 years after the resurrection of Christ, but how that meets our world and our life and our church. And so as we are concluding this series, um, what, what, we've, what we've seen is we've seen a downward progression. We really, it's like a downward spiral. You started with Ephesus, and, and Ephesus had lost their first love. The church at Ephesus, they had right doctrine, and, and they, they understood uh, clearly who Christ was, and they weren't compromising with false teachers or false teaching, but they had lost that heart of love, that supreme love for Christ. This is the church at Ephesus. Then we looked at the church at Pergamum. And it gets a little bit further into this downward spiral. And, and there, was a, a, who, who, there, there were a few in Pergamum who were compromising with the world. And so it wasn't the majority. It was just a few. But the majority of church were faithful. But there were some who were compromising with the world. And then you get down even further into this downward spiral, the church at Thyatira, where the majority of the congregation were embracing what the text called the deep things of Satan. So Thyatira was not just dabbling, there weren't just a few in there that were dabbling with compromise within the world, but the congregation as a whole, the majority had gotten into what was called the deep things of Satan. And it was the minority, the remnant of the church who had stayed faithful. Then you had the church at Sardis that was dead. It was dead. They still had a remnant that had remained pure, but the Lord said that this church thought they were alive, but they were actually dead. And if you think that that can't get any worse, we look at Laodicea today. And now we end with the church that the Lord uses the imagery of spit. And that word spit, this can be in the text, is literally translated vomit. He uses the imagery of spit or vomit to describe his response to their hypocrisy. Wow. Like what a progression from a church that lost its first love in Ephesus down to this church where their hypocrisy caused the Lord to want to vomit. And so this is some very compelling things that we're going to look at here this morning. And if there is one primary lesson, as we're looking at a lesson before we dive into this lesson, there's one primary lesson for us as we, as, as we study these letters, it would be this. The Lord cares deeply about the spiritual condition of his people. Isn't that overwhelmingly clear? After looking at most of these letters, and we're gonna look at this last letter here, the Lord cares deeply about the spiritual condition of his people and the spiritual condition of his churches, that it matters. It matters. The purity of our heart, the way in which we live, our testimony in the, the community in which God has placed us, the unity that we walk in, the love for one another that we walk in. And that it, it, it matters. This is what is overwhelmingly clear, that it matters that we would be who God's called us to be individually, but as a congregation, that Living Word Church would be the church that God has called her to be. Do you believe that? It matters deeply. So be, before we jump into this letter, some very important uh, background elements that will help us as we unpack this letter even further on into this sermon. So just a few things here. Laodicea was a very wealthy city. They were very, very wealthy. They had a lot of finances, a lot of industry. They were known for their gold, for their wealth. And the city, because of that, was known for its ease of, of living. If you wanted to go on vacation, you went to Laodicea. If you had resources and means, this was a city you went and were a part of because they were known for their ease of living that was afforded to them because of their great wealth. And they accumulated a lot of wealth because of uh, some industries that were very profitable for them. One in particular, they were known for their production of soft black wool. So they were known for their production of soft black wool. And then also in this area, uh, there was a school of medicine that produced a lot of various types of medicines. 
But there was one medicine in particular that they, that, that they were known for, and it was an eye salve, an eye medicine. And so these industries, whether, whether it was the, the, the industry of medicine or the industry of, of fabric, this, this produced a lot of wealth in this community and in this city. And so because of that, they had a, an ease of living. Because of that, they were comfortable. They were a comfortable, prosperous society, city. And here's another interesting detail about this city. Their water system, where they, where they got their water, it came from other locations in the surrounding areas, and they had an, an underground aqueduct system, like underground piping of water that would come down from different areas, and it was miles long of their water coming down to them. And so all of these things, all these details that I just brought out here are going to come into play as we unpack this letter. So let's look at the letter, Revelation chapter 3. Let's read this letter that is to a church in, in the middle of prosperity, in the middle of prosperous surroundings. Revelation 3. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither hot, you, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or, or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his, on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Wow, what great imagery, what great pictures. That, did you guys catch the prosperity, the, the garments, the eye salve, you, you see the imagery here. And we're going to unpack what that really means and what it looks like for them, but for us here today. And, and so, so what is it that we learn from this final letter to this church that has no praise from the Lord? There's no praise. No, you're doing good here. You're faithful here. You're faithful there. There's no praise for this church, only rebuke. I see three powerful realities concerning us, Christ and the gospel. The first one would be this. Here's the first truth that we learn. Half-hearted spirituality benefits no one. Half-hearted spirituality benefits no one. Look back at the text. I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you would either be cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, you're half-hearted. You're lukewarm, you're on the fence, neither hot nor cold. I would spew you, spit you, vomit you out of my mouth. Half-hearted spirituality, lukewarm spirituality benefits no one. No one is benefited by a lukewarm Christian, by a half-hearted Christian, half-hearted person. Now, notice, notice it says here, and this is very common in the letters. It's not every letter, but most of the, of the letters, Jesus begins by saying, I know your works. I know your works. So, so it's interesting. The Lord is acknowledging, I, I can see you. I know your works. I know your heart. Our works matter. The way in which we live matters, and it's clear over and over again. The Lord of the church looks at all these churches, and he says, I know your works. I know how you're living. I see your life. That should be really telling to us that the Lord sees and knows our life and that it matters. You know, it's so important for us to remember that good works, though they do not save us, our good works do declare the reality of the spiritual condition of our heart. This is why Jesus is saying, I know your works, because our works do declare something about our life. They declare the reality of the spiritual condition of our heart. Where our heart is set, the direction our heart is set is the direction our life will go. So the Lord of this church says, I know your works. Jesus said this in Matthew 7. He says, you will know them by their, by their fruit. Our works matter. The direction of our life and what we're pursuing matters. 
So what, what is it? What does Jesus know about, about this church? What, what does he know? He knows, he says very clearly, he says, you're not cold and you're not hot. He says what? You are, you're lukewarm. Lukewarm. Well, you're warm. You're not cold. You're not hot. You're lukewarm. This is what he knows. This is what he's declaring. He's declaring, I know your works and I know that you are on the fence. I know that you are half-hearted. I know that you are lukewarm. What, 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 does, what does lukewarm represent? It, it, it's, it's, it's obviously a picture of water. And just think about how useless lukewarm water is. How many of you, 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 you go exercise and you are, are, are running around the block and you're exercising or you're outside cutting your grass or you're doing some work outside. It's hot, you're hot and you're sweaty. How many of you, you sit outside and you think to yourself, oh, I just wish I had a nice tall glass of lukewarm water right now. Does that ever cross your mind? No, what do you, what do you want? You want a nice, tall glass of ice cold water. You don't want lukewarm water. You're not, you're not out there cutting the grass and you walk in and you say, honey, honey, could you please get me a glass of warm water? Like whoever says that? We don't say that because lukewarm water is basically good for nothing. What do you use it for? You use hot water to take a bath or a shower. You use cold water for refreshing, and I'm sure there's somebody in here with a medical background that's going to tell me lukewarm water is good for something. I, I'm sure that's in the room right now. But for this, for this illustration right now, for what the Lord is saying, lukewarm is half-hearted. He would say, I'd rather you be hot or cold. I'd rather you be hot or cold. What's interesting about Laodicea, you remember I told you about their underground water system? miles long of piping that would have water that would travel down. Well, the water would travel from different areas. One area it would come from uh, was Hierapolis. It was a, a, a city that was in the area. It was a mountainous region, and the water would be ice cold coming from the mountain, but it would come down from the mountain into their aqueduct system, and by the time it got to them, it would be lukewarm. So it was known in Laodicea that whenever visitors would come to visit and they would get to the water supply and they would drink, they were expecting something and they didn't know what they were about to get. Maybe they were journeying for days to get to Laodicea. It was a very wealthy, prosperous city to come and be a part of the action in the big, prosperous city. And they get there and they're thirsty and they're expecting something and they dip into the water system and they drink a, a, a refreshing drink of lukewarm water and they would pff, spit it out. It was very common. History would tell us this. When you would study this area, they would spit out the warm water because it wasn't what they were expecting. It's kind of like, you ever done this? You go to a restaurant, you order a certain drink, and they give you something else. I've done this before. I've ordered the Dr. Pepper, and they gave me a Diet Coke. That's got to be the worst, the worst unmet expectation I don't know who drinks Diet Coke and why you would ever decide to drink Diet Coke. If you're going to drink the sugar, just go for it anyway. Who can handle that aftertaste? Just spit it out of your mouth. But what's the spiritual application here? It's not about Dr. Pepper or Diet Coke. It's not about uh, warm water for the person who, get, who's getting, uh, who wants to be refreshed and they're not refreshed so they spit it out. It's not necessarily about water. It's not what the Lord is saying He's dealing with the reality of half-hearted spirituality, lukewarmness, on the fence. You're not hot, you're not cold. What are the spiritual applications for this picture of hot, cold, and lukewarm? One commentary puts it like this. Hot spiritual people or spiritually hot people are those who are spiritually alive and possess the fervency of a transformed life. That's a person who is spiritually on fire for the Lord they possess the fervency of a transformed life. They are passionate for the Lord and it is unmistakable. You would never mistake them for being lukewarm. You never mistake them for being cold. They are hot on fire for God. The spiritually cold are best understood as those who reject Jesus Christ. The gospel leaves them unmoved. It evokes in them no spiritual response. They have no interest in Christ, his word, or his church, and they make no pretense. They are not hypocrites. A spiritually cold person, they're going to let you know, no, nah, I'm not a Christian, and I'm not going to fake it either. I'm not going to fake being a Christian. I'm not a hypocrite. I don't believe in Christ, and I'm not a Christ follower, and that's who I am. 
the hot person on fire for the Lord, you know by their life that they're on fire for the Lord, that they love Christ. The spiritually cold person, they, they, you know that as well in their life. The lukewarm person, however, they fit into the, neither category. They're not genuinely saved, yet they do not openly reject the gospel. So, so, so they, they're not Christians if you're spiritually lukewarm. If you, are, if, you, if you have no passion for the Lord, it would be a sign that you may not be a believer. And so you, but you're also not rejecting of the gospel. They may even attend church and claim to know the Lord. But like the Pharisees, they are content to practice a self-righteous religion. And they are, they are hypocrites playing games. Right? Hot, cold, lukewarm. The hot person is passionate pursuing the Lord. The cold person, there's hope because they can hear the gospel and the spirit can work and they can be saved. But the lukewarm person who's playing hypocritical spiritual games, it benefits no one. It does not benefit them or, or, or anyone else. Half-hearted spirituality benefits no one. Being half-hearted or lukewarm does not benefit the half-hearted person. It doesn't benefit those who are in the world. So if you are a half-hearted, lukewarm person who's playing like they're a Christian, the world doesn't benefit from you. You don't benefit from that, and the world doesn't benefit from you either. It's, it's, like, it's like lukewarm effort on your job. Who benefits from lukewarm effort on your job? Half-hearted effort. You don't benefit it because you're going to lose your job. Those that you work with don't benefit from you because they have to work harder to pick up your slack. And your boss doesn't benefit from lukewarm effort because you're costing the company money because other people have to pick up your slack and the job's not getting done in time. Lukewarm effort doesn't help you in your spiritual life, on your job, in your marriage. How many of you realize half-hearted effort in your marriage benefits no one? How many of you know you need to be on fire for your spouse, passionate for your spouse. Lukewarm effort in your marriage doesn't benefit anyone. You, your spouse, your family, your friends. What about in the classroom, students? Does lukewarm effort benefit you in in the classroom? It doesn't. You're not gonna get that scholarship money and hopefully mom and dad been saving some money for college, right? It benefits no one. It hurts you and then it hurts your parents because they gotta fork out more money to send you to college because you didn't get the scholarships. What about as a friend, any lukewarm friends? Lukewarm friends. You ever had a lukewarm friend? Are you a lukewarm friend? Half-hearted friend, right? You see the application here? Half-hearted spirituality benefits no one. A half-hearted approach in our life and in every area, whether it's marriage or family or church or our job in the classroom, wherever, it benefits No one in the Lord is looking at this church and says, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're in the middle, you're lukewarm. And he's saying that you're not being benefited at all by this. You're actually in danger of judgment. I want to spit you out of my mouth. Just like the residents in Laodicea would spit out that lukewarm, tepid water. And this, but this, unfortunately, this half-hearted approach, unfortunately, is the spiritual climate of the day in 2021. It is our temptation, my brothers and sisters. It is our current temptation. It has always been the temptation. You see it in Laodicea, 40 years after the resurrection. You see it's the temptation then for Christians. It is a temptation now for us. But you go through, you take a society through the year of 2020, and I believe the church has gotten through the side, on the other side of this, but we have never been the same as a church culture in our world. Where now it's, if I have time, if it doesn't get in the way, this tends to be our approach now to Christianity, to spiritual things. And the wealth of this city and the wealth, the prosperity of our life puts us into a position that if we're not careful, even as Christians, we can slip over into kind of this half-hearted, Laodicea type approach to our relationship with God. That's the climate of the day today. Pursuit of spiritual things and commitment to the body of Christ is, can, can often be replaced with earthbound temporary priorities. And prosperity does that to us. We don't necessarily feel like we need that fervency like we used to have. You guys ever read some of the parables the Lord tells? And tells them, you can see them in all four of the Gospels. And you can look at these parables. And he gives, he gives pictures of the kingdom of God, what the kingdom of God is like. 
And there's one parable about wise virgins and foolish virgins. And he tells us in Matthew 25. And it, the context is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and complacency. So he tells this parable. Look at Matthew 25. It says, And the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. The Lord has come, right? The coming of the Lord. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. The wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I don't know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Do you see the picture? This is the picture the Lord is communicating to us, I believe, through the church at Laodicea. Hot or cold, right? If you're lukewarm, it benefits no one. We have to, cannot afford to be spiritually complacent in our life. We have to be ready at any moment for the coming of the Lord. We have to live as if the Lord is coming back now. He's coming back now, tomorrow, the next moment. We live with our Lamps filled with oil. We live ready. Complacency spiritually benefits no one. And it will lead to this next reality we see in this church. The first reality is a half-hearted spirituality benefits no one. And secondly, trusting in our own righteousness will leave us self-deceived. So when we live that half-hearted spiritual life, that hypocritical spiritual life, we can become self-deceived and trust in our own righteousness. Look back at the text, Revelation 3.17. He says, for you say, who says? The lukewarm people at Laodicea say, hey, I'm rich. I've prospered and need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. What a stark contrast. Look at the words there. You say, I'm rich, Laodicea. You say, I'm rich. I have lots of gold, lots of money. You say, I'm rich. You, you say, I need nothing. Not realizing you are wretched, pitiable, which means you are to be pitied. And then you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. You remember the three areas that they were proud of? They were wealthy. They created black wool and eye salve. The Lord of the church looks at this church, this city, in Laodicea, and he says, you don't realize what you pride yourself in, you don't even have. You are actually poor. You're blind and you're naked. He speaks to the church, you think because you are rich and prospering that you need nothing. You think that because you are rich and prospering, you need nothing. So what kind of riches is the Lord talking about here? Is it money and possessions? I don't believe it's money and possessions the Lord is actually talking about, though he is referencing that into the life of their city and their, their area. But what is he actually talking about? I, I think a, 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 it's not a parable, but it's, it's an actual conversation the Lord had with a young man in Matthew 19, the text that Pastor Dominic read right, right before our prayer time. Look at this story. I think this answers a question for us of what our Lord is speaking about here. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And the, the rich man said, which ones? Give me the boxes. I'll check them. Jesus said, you should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, hey, I've kept all of those. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. 
When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Wow, what a compelling story, right? This is what I believe the Lord is after with the church of Laodicea here. He's after this idea of being rich, rich in your own works or rich towards God. Rich in your own works or rich towards God and, and what he has done for us through the cross. The rich man in Matthew 19 not, not only was physically rich for he had great possessions, but he was rich in his own good works. And Jesus puts this man's apparent desire to do good deeds to have eternal life. He puts it to the test and Jesus says, okay, Okay, you think it's by being good that someone enters the kingdom? Well, here's the good deed that I want you to do. You think you've, you've kept all the commandments? What, what do you lack? Well, here's what I'm really after. Take everything that you have, all of your possessions, give it away to the poor, then come follow me. So what was the Lord doing with the rich young ruler? He was actually getting after the heart of the matter. He was actually getting after the God of the rich young man, which was his wealth. He was exposing the heart of the rich young man. It, it, it is not that Jesus was telling him that by giving away his goods, he was going to enter eternal life. It was by telling him, he was telling him that eternal life comes through a total commitment of all of your life towards me. Eternal life, receiving eternal life does not come by obeying the law or by being a good person. Receiving eternal life comes through a total commitment of your life to Christ. Jesus got to the heart of the matter. This man's wealth was his real God. And he thought he was obeying God. Right? Just like this church at Laodicea, I am rich, I'm prospering, I don't need anything. The rich young ruler would have been in the same position and he didn't realize that he lacked everything actually. The rich young ruler lacked everything. He went away sorrowful because he was actually unwilling to give his all to Christ, which is what it means to be a Christian, right? Hot on the fire for the Lord means you have given him your all, right? Not realizing he was self-deceived. He believed incorrectly about the source of his righteousness, just like this church at Laodicea. The same was true for them. And the same can be true for us, can it not? Not realizing, not realizing. Have you ever not realized something that was obvious to you or to, or to everybody else? You ever realize, have you ever not realized something that's obvious to everyone else? Maybe it's like the kid who thinks he's beating his dad in golf, but he's really not. He's really not. And I might be speaking to somebody who might be in this room or not be in this room wherever my 15-year-old son is about to be 16. Is He thinks he might have beat his dad in golf, but he really has not yet, right? He doesn't realize he's self-deceived. Or it's like a boss taking credit for something they didn't do, right? They're self-deceived. Look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Or it's like a young man in seventh grade thinking he has a chance with the senior prom queen. Not realizing, buddy, you don't have a chance. Poor buddy is self-deceived, right? How much more consequential are eternal realities? Much more consequential than a seventh grader wanting to date a 12th grader or, or a, a son wanting to beat his dad in golf or, or, or any of these realities where we could possibly be deceived about reality. Eternal truths and realities are the most important. So this church that is deceived, they think, they have all that they need. We lack nothing. The rich young ruler thinks, he says, he says look, I've, I've, keep, I've kept the commandments from my youth. What do I lack? What is he saying when he asks that question? He's not literally asking a question. He was hoping the Lord would not have an answer to that question. You realize that, right? He's asking a question he didn't want an answer to. He gave the Lord his answer. His answer was, I've done all that. Okay, I'm good. And the Lord says, oh, no, 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 you're not because I know your heart. And I know who your real God is. You don't realize that you are missing the whole kingdom because you don't understand correctly who I am. And you're not willing to give all that you are. It's like the scribes and Pharisees in Jesus' day who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. You remember the parable in Luke 18? The Pharisee and the tax collector, they go to the temple to pray. 
The Pharisee walks into the temple and he looks up and he, and he spreads his arms wide and he says, oh God, I thank you that I'm not like that sinner and, and that sinner and especially that wicked tax collector. I thank you I'm not like them. I thank you I'm not like sinners. And God, I thank you that I give tithe of all that I possess. Everything I own, I give tithe to you, Lord. So the Pharisee in this parable that Jesus is telling is looking at someone who says, I've got it all, I've given it all, I've done all, I'm not bad, and I'm really good. I reject sin, I reject evil, I'm not like all these evil people in the world, but I'm also really good. I pay tithe off of everything that I own. And then you had the this tax collector who was in the temple with the Pharisee. He won't even lift his head up to pray. And he simply says, while he's beating his chest, be merciful to me, God, a sinner. I'm a sinner. Be merciful to me. And the Lord looked at both of those, and, and he's telling this story to the Pharisees, this, this illustrative story the Lord is telling to the Pharisees so they can hear it, so they can understand, just like the rich young ruler, just like the church at Laodicea. The Lord wants them to know, you don't, don't continue to be a hypocrite. Don't continue to be half-hearted spiritually. Be hot. I would rather you be hot or cold because if you're cold, at least the gospel can get to you. So the Lord is looking at the Pharisees when he's telling this story to them. He's saying, I want you to see who you really are. You don't realize that the story that I'm telling is about you. I'm exposing you. This is who you are. You think you're something that you're not. And the one that will go to his house justified from the parable of Luke 18 is the tax collector. That's what the Lord said. Not the Pharisee who had all the boxes checked like the rich young ruler. They said, yeah, Lord, I've done it. I've not committed murder. I've not done, committed uh, any adultery. I've not cheated, lied, or stolen. I've kept all the commandments but they were self-deceived. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. This is the rich man in Matthew 19. It's the Pharisee in Luke 18, and it is the church in Laodicea. Half-hearted spirituality benefits no one. And trusting in our own righteousness will leave us what? Self-deceived. Wow. Thirdly, Here's what we see, building on what we've looked at so far. True spiritual prosperity can only come from Christ. And this, my brothers and sisters, is the good news of the gospel. This is the good news for the rich young ruler. He, he, was, he was wanting to live under the weight, and this was the, the, the system that he was under during that time. He's like, yeah, I'll take on myself the weight of being good enough to inherit eternal life. And the gospel says, no, Christ took upon himself all the weight that you could ever carry, and he did it for you. True spiritual prosperity can only come from Christ. Look at the text, 318. I counsel you, the Lord says, buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. And white garments, you remember they manufactured black wool? He says, buy from me white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Wow, isn't that powerful? Notice the Lord uses three examples that this church would have understood. Wealth, garments, and I salve. And you know what all those three represented? They represented the strength of these people, at least what they perceived as their strength, their wealth, their wool, their garments, and their I salve. What's the Lord saying right here in this section? He's saying, look, buy from me. You've done it your way for too long. You've depended on yourself for too long. Rich young ruler, Matthew 25, Tax collector, Luke 18, church at Laodicea, Living Word Church, any, any of us that have fallen in this category, you've done it your way for too long. You've depended on yourself for too long. Buy from me what you actually need. 
Have you ever been around somebody that knew they had it all together? They didn't, they were the church at Laodicea. They didn't, they th think they lacked anything. They read their own press clippings, right? Proud of the resources and giftings they have. They don't mind telling everyone around them. They read their own press, press clippings. You know, when I thought about that in this section here, I thought about Tom Brady. Who knows Tom Brady? How do you not know Tom Brady, right? That's the better question. Oh yeah, there it is. I was gonna kind of wait to build the moment here, telling my story. But Tom Brady posts this picture. You see the one there, I guess it would be his right hand, ring finger, Tampa Bay Buccaneers there, seven rings. Do you think any of us in here did not know that Tom Brady had won seven Super Bowls? I mean, maybe some of you did, right? <laughs> don't, don't, don't know. <laughs> but most everyone knows, right? Why is it that Tom Brady decided to go on Twitter and Instagram to post these pictures right here? Why do you think he's doing that? Because this is who he is, right? And he wants everyone to know, hey, I am the GOAT, the greatest of all time. And that's what I thought of when I, was, when I was reading this about somebody who's trusting in themselves and their own strength and, and, and they're, tr they're trusting in their wealth and their abilities. And I want you to know that I'm great. Everyone knows Tom Brady. Everyone knows Tom. You're really good. You won seven Super Bowls. We didn't need you to post that on Twitter to remind us that you're really, really good and you're the best that has ever played the game of football. Right? That's Laodicea. That's Luke 18. That's Matthew 25. Hey, I got it all together. Lord, what do I lack? I've checked all my boxes. I got my seven rings, right? I've done it all. What do I lack? You've not given all yet. You've not given all yet. You know, uh, I hope, hope Tom Brady would listen to this message, but he won't like what I'm about to say here. I did just call him the greatest of all time, but he's not gonna like who I'm, who I'm gonna compare him to. But there is a, a man in the Bible who was a king. His name was Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter four. You remember, those, you remember that story? Oh, King Neb read his own press clippings and he thought he was the stuff. If there would have been Twitter, he would have not posted seven rings, he would have posted 700 rings of all the wealth that this man possessed. He was the king of Babylon and he was the greatest king of that time. Babylon was the greatest of that era. And the Lord had to get a hold of King Neb to humble him. So I believe that a modern day example of King Nebuchadnezzar could, could be Tom Brady, but let's pray. Let's, let's pray for Tom Brady, okay? Listen to this, Daniel 4. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered, I don't know who he's answering, because I don't see a conversation going on here. He's talking to himself. And he said, is not this great Babylon, which I have built with my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty, seven rings, Tom Brady, Twitter, Instagram, look at me. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox in seven periods of time, which would be seven years shall pass over you until you know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will. Amen? Oh man, depending on our own strength, depending on our own prosperity, depending on ourself is always a dangerous place to live, right? Because then you can begin to believe the lie and be self-deceived like the rich young ruler, like King Nebuchadnezzar, like Tom Brady or whoever else, right? That it's me, I did it, I've got it. It's my wealth, it's my garments, it's my eyes. It's who I am. But the truth of the gospel is, is that true Spirituality can only come. True spiritual prosperity can only come from Christ. And Christ has been crying for generations, buy from me. I am the source of everything that you need. Prophet Isaiah declares from the Lord a picture of Christ's call to you and to me. 
and to all that will listen. Isaiah 55, come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters, and he who has no money, the Lord says, come and buy. What does he really mean by buying? He really means if you have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. When you buy from the Lord, it is free of charge. It's the best Black Friday special ever. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. The Lord calls to this church in Laodicea. He says, buy from me. Don't depend on your own strength your own resources, your own good works. Don't live in self-deception. Buy from me. So what do these three pictures also symbolize? Well, they symbolize, as it said, gold, white garments, and eye salve. Well, what does that mean? It, gold, it, gold refined by fire is this. This represents genuine salvation, true spiritual riches. What Christ is saying here in this text and the, to the church at Laodicea, and to the rich young ruler, and in Luke 18, he's saying, I am the only way that someone can genuinely be saved. True spiritual riches come from me. First Peter 1, in this you rejoice. So now for a little while, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold, though it perishes, it is tested by fire, right? Our faith is more precious than gold. Faith in Christ, belief in Christ, true spiritual riches is more precious than any possession that we could ever own. What about these white garments? This represents being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Remember they had black wool was their garments? He says, buy white from me. Buy white garments from me. Because white represents purity and holiness and, and it represents through the gospel lens the very righteousness of Christ. When Adam and Eve sinned, what happened? They didn't know they were naked before, but they knew they were naked. You remember what it said in the beginning of Revelation 3? Buy from me these white garments so that the shame of your nakedness would be removed. It's a picture back even in Genesis, whenever Adam and Eve sinned, they knew they were naked. Shame entered the human race. And what did Adam and Eve try to do to cover their shame and their sin? They tried to cover their sin their own way. They took fig leaves, fruit of the ground, fruit of self-effort, fruit of the work of the ground, and to cover their lives. But God said, no, 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 no. That can only be dealt with my way. I will deal with your shame and your sin my way. And in a, in a picture of Christ, all the way back in Genesis, God took the skins of an animal and he clothed Adam and Eve and gave us a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that we can be clothed with the very righteousness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5. For our sake, he made him Christ to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become what? The righteousness of God. Something we could never become on our own, rich young ruler. Pharisee, Luke 18, church at Laodicea. Something we could never become on our own. We can never become on our own righteous. But through faith in Christ, we can become the very righteousness of Christ. What about this I salve? This represents the understanding and knowledge of spiritual truth. Spiritual blindness represents the lack of ability to see spiritual things correctly. Do you remember when Saul of Tarsus was stopped in his tracks on the road, going to go persecute and kill Christians? The Lord gave him a vision, stopped him, and says, look, I'm sending you to do what? Acts 26, to open their eyes so that they may turn from what? From darkness to light. Darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is the power of the gospel. This is the eye salve of the gospel that when we're believers, we can see the light now. We can see truth now. We can acknowledge and recognize what's actually going on in our world today because the light of the gospel is shown in our hearts and, and we can see spiritual truth correctly. So the Lord, in conclusion here today, the Lord of the church is calling us today. He's saying, buy free of charge 
the true spiritual riches of salvation in Christ. He says, by free of charge, the righteousness that comes through Christ's work on the cross. And by free of charge, true spiritual vision to be able to see the world around us correctly. That's what the Lord's telling us. And after eight weeks of thinking deeply about what the Lord has done for his bride and what he desires for us individually and as a congregation, I want us to end, I want us to end singing a song of surrender to the Lord. After eight weeks of hearing messages over and over again of what the Lord is desiring for us, I want to end singing a song of surrender. A song of saying, Lord, we want to be all that you've called us to be. Is that the desire of your heart? God, I want to be all that you've called me to be. And maybe you have been in that lukewarm position. Today's the day. Surrender, re-surrender to the Lord. Get off of the fence. Pursue Christ. Maybe you're, maybe, may, maybe you're not even a believer here today. Today's the day to surrender to the Lord to come at his feet and surrender and say, God, I'm tired of being cold. I'm tired of not following you and going my own way, depending on my own strength. I'm coming and I want to buy from you true spiritual riches, forgiveness. I want to be clothed in your righteousness. I want true spiritual vision. I want to end singing a song. I want to read the lyrics to you. It's called Resurrender. So it says this, it says, you're turning over tables and calling for return to our lives upon the altar, the things we did at first. You're clearing out the temple. You're cleaning out the dirt for we are your territory. Lord, we are your church. We are your people. You are our God. We are your temple. Make us holy like you are. You see a holy nation, a flock to consecrate, a chosen generation, a people called to pray. So help us, God, to please you where only you can see for every moment matters in eternity. We are your people. You are our God. We are your temple. Make us holy like you are. We are your children. You set us apart, God, for your glory. Make us holy like you are. Mark your people with your presence. Make us a place where you delight to dwell. May we heed your hand's correction. O oh Lord, our shepherd, you do all things well. Your love is firm as it is tender. Your law is perfect and your judgment's true. As we run to, resur to resurrender, you will restore what we return to you. You are restoring as we yield anew. If you're calling, we're coming. We're not walking, we're running. God, we re-surrender. God, we re-surrender. Would you, would you stand to your feet with me as we close singing this and singing of a heart, singing of our hearts, from our hearts of surrender to the Lord. We re-surrender to you, God. We surrender our hearts and our lives to you, every single one of us here today have areas in our life, God, that we can say in sincerity and truth, Lord, that we need to lay them at your feet today. We need to surrender, to re-surrender things that we've taken back and embraced that we say, no, Lord, we want to read this, surrender this to you, give this to you. We strayed, we've gone astray in areas. We've, we're not where we should be. So, Lord, as a church, Lord, as we've finished reading and studying these letters to these seven churches, God, I pray that we would remember, we would remember that you care deeply about the purity and the holiness of your church because it is a direct reflection of the witness that we are called to give into our community. And God, I pray that that would be true of our lives not just what we sing, not just what we say or what we preach, but may it actually be true of our lives. And may we as a church be a shining example of what it looks like to have the gospel transform us 
from the inside out. Lord, that is our prayer. It's my prayer for your people. God, we are your people. We are your church. Lord, make us holy like you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I, I love you. I'll see you next Sunday for our Christmas service.